just a quick review. We've, we were told that a famine had hit the land of Judah, and instead of trusting God, a husband, a particular husband, moves his family from Judah to a country called Moab, a land of pagan people who didn't follow God. He moved his family away from God and away from God's people, and not too long after that happened, the husband died. So the family is in Moab, and the husband dies. And then the sons marry Moabite women, which is kind of a natural thing that would take place, and then the sons die. And so what we are left with are three widows. And the wife hears, the, the matriarch of the family, she hears that God is blessing his people again. So she decides, we're going back home. I'm going back home. I'm going back to God. I'm going back to God's people And in verse 22 of Ruth chapter 1, it says, Naomi returned from Moab, accompanied by her daughter-in-law, Ruth. One daughter-in-law chose to stay at home in Moab, but Ruth chose to go with her. It says, they arrived in Bethlehem at the beginning of the barley harvest. So Ruth and Naomi literally have nothing. I mean, they have left their home as a family, moved to Moab, and now they've left Moab and are coming back, and they... They, they have no, they're flat broke. They, the fridge is empty. And so Ruth takes the initiative and puts her trust in what God had already set up. God commanded his people in Leviticus 25 and Deuteronomy 25. God has commanded um, his people not to harvest their fields fully, but to leave what was dropped so the needy could gather food. So it says in, in Ruth chapter 2, verse, verse 2, one day Ruth said to Naomi, let me go out into the harvest fields to pick up the stalks of grain left behind. Naomi replied, all right, my daughter, go ahead. So Ruth went out to gather grain behind the harvesters. And read these words with me, as it happened. And as it happened, that's the providence of God. We've talked about that. As it happened, Ruth found herself working in the field that belonged to Boaz. Ruth could have ended up in anyone's field, but she didn't because God was working behind the scenes. That is God's providence. Boaz shows Ruth kindness. Ruth ends up working for him all day in the field, gathering a full basket of grain, which is equivalent to about two weeks' wages in one day. That's quite a a payroll there. And she is even invited to join him for lunch, he and the workers, And so Ruth returns home after all that's taken place, and Naomi begins to ask questions. Where did you gather all this grain today? Where did you work? So Ruth told her mother-in-law, the man I worked with today is named, come on, read it with me, Boaz, Boaz. And Naomi says to her, may the Lord bless him. He is showing his kindness to us. That man is one of our closest relatives, one of our family redeemers. Again, in these passages in Deuteronomy and Leviticus, we've learned that God made a way to provide for widows and families through what was called the kinsman redeemer law. Um, This was a person that would redeem the family line, redeem the the family land, the people and the property, if they were willing and qualified to, to play that role for the family. And Naomi is saying, this man Boaz, this field that you have found yourself in, this man Boaz is that kind of redeemer to us. And then we're told that Ruth worked alongside the women in Boaz's fields and gathered grain with them until the end of the barley harvest. Then she worked with them through the wheat harvest. So now we're talking a couple of months, maybe three months of time has went by. And it says all the while she lived with her mother-in-law, Naomi. And we learn through the story that we get the idea, it's implied, that Ruth is interested in Boaz. I mean, who wouldn't be, right? I mean, he was a man of wealth, he was a man of influence, he was a godly man, he was a generous man, and he was single. And so Ruth was interested in Boaz. So at the end of the harvest, the mother-in-law, Naomi, tells Ruth to go to Boaz and express your heart to him. And so we're told in Ruth chapter 3 that Ruth went down to the threshing floor that night. After Boaz had finished eating and drinking, he lay down at the far end of the pile of grain and went to sleep. And this was kind of a common thing that at the harvest time, all the piles of grain would be put together. And it was a time of celebration of what had just taken place. And all of the harvest that they had, this is when the employees would get paid out of the harvest. And then they would stay that night to guard it, to keep it safe, so that no thieves would take their profits. Makes sense. And so he's asleep, and it says that Ruth, Ninja Ruth, 
right there, you know, came quietly, uncovered his feet, and lay down. And around midnight, Boaz suddenly woke up and turned over. He was surprised to find a woman lying at his feet, and he asked, who are you? And what Ruth says here is going to set the tone, the pace, for what's going to take place in the next part of our story. She says, I am your servant, Ruth. Spread the corner of your covering over me, for you are my family redeemer. In ancient Hebrew culture, we've learned that covering a woman with a blanket or a shawl was seen as an intent for marriage, a proposal for marriage. So Ruth is basically telling him that she wants him to marry her. Everybody follow that? She wasn't proposing. She wasn't 21st century. It's still Middle Eastern culture here that we're talking about. She wasn't proposing. She was just asking, will you take me as your wife? And so Boaz responds, don't worry about a thing. I will do what is necessary, but while it's true that I am one of your family redeemers, there is, read that with me, another. Hmm. There is another man who is more closely related to you than I am. In the morning, I will talk to him. If he is willing to redeem you, very well, let him marry you. But if he is not willing, then as surely as the Lord lives, I will redeem you myself. This other guy, get this, this other guy's in first position to marry Ruth, to take the land, but Boaz is saying, I want to marry you, Ruth, and, and I will do everything I can to find a way to make this happen. And so the next day in Ruth chapter 4, we read this, Boaz went to the town gate and took a seat there. So Boaz is the single, successful, godly businessman. He's wealthy, he's influential, he, he owns and runs this business, he works in this business, and the town gate is a place where businessmen would conduct business. It was a formal place, it was a legal place. The thing I find so interesting about the book of Ruth, and I don't know if you've ever caught this before, but the, the book of Ruth, it doesn't mention at all the temple of God or a synagogue of God. It doesn't mention the worship of God at any religious place. Get this, everything that happens in the book of Ruth pretty much happens at work. Now, I don't know about you, but I find that exciting because that means that pretty much everything that God wants to do, even in our lives, hello, it's going to happen where? At work. And so often we think the opposite. We think, oh no, the, the most I'm ever going to get of God is in a religious place. When all along God is saying, no, no, I, I'm with you. Remember that's what Jesus said? I mean, so many times in, in the God, I'm with you. He even said that when he was ready to leave and he gave the commission to his apostles. He said, don't forget, I'm, I'm with you. I'm with you. The Holy Spirit, when the Holy Spirit was given to us in the book of Acts, why was the Holy Spirit given? So that we would have the Spirit of God with us wherever we went. Think about that. Now, I know this is Old Testament and this is ancient, but this, to me, this is exciting to think that, you know, we think that God only moves in religious places, but more often than not, God moves in not-so-religious places. I mean, God moves at our place of work. Here's an exciting thing. I mean, I'm, I'm sharing this right now in a time when some of us are not going into the office anymore or not going into our jobs because we've been banned, you know, we got to stay home and work from home. But when we get ready to go back to work, here's an exciting thing. Think about the fact that God is going to do something in your life at work. Wow. It changes things, doesn't it? I don't know about you, but it does for me. It changes my, my approach to work, my approach to my job, my, my um, you know, getting ready to even go into work. It's like, maybe I should have an excitement about what God's going to do in my day when I go to work, when you go to work. And God doesn't just move in our lives when we're at church. God moves in our lives at work. And, and here, this is a good one. Now, get... We're not going to be coming to church for the next couple of weeks, and, and some of us are not going to work for the next couple of weeks. Um, but God is with us all the time. In fact, if you're following God, you're in God's presence everywhere. 
Did you realize that? Everywhere. Huh. At work, at church, at home, wherever you are, God's with you. God is moving. God is acting on your behalf. He is doing things in your life wherever you are. So the town gate was the place where men would conduct business, where, where you, know, you would meet with someone to negotiate a deal, make an agreement, official, official or legal, all of that. And it says, so Boaz went to the town gate, took a seat there. Just then, here's that providence of God thing again, just then the family redeemer that he had mentioned came by. Oh, coincidence, right? I mean, think about it. Boaz, he's sitting at the gate, and he's waiting. Not him. Not him. I mean, how long is he going to wait? Not him. Hey, I think that's him. I, I think that that's him. Can you imagine? Of all the days that he's sitting at the gate, here comes the guy walking by. I mean, this, this is God working through providence. I mean, sometimes God works through his visible hand of miracles, and, and we know that to be supernatural things that take place. And all of us have experienced God's hand of miracles, supernatural things taking place in our lives. But God isn't just limited to that. In fact, most of the time in our lives, God works through the everyday normal life. That's called the providence of God, the invisible hand of providence where God is working in our lives, working things out. Just then, the family redeemer he had mentioned came by, so Boaz called out to him, hey, come over here and sit down, friend. I want to talk to you. So they sat down together. Boaz doesn't use his name. In fact, his name is not even mentioned in this chapter. He calls him friend. I think it's the Old Testament way of saying, hey, what's up, dude? Come on over, right? I mean, that's kind of what's going on. And so he invites the other man to sit down at the gate. Then Boaz called 10 leaders from the town and asked them to sit as witnesses. So basically he's saying, I want to make a business transaction here. I want it to be official and legal, and we need witnesses. And he says to the family redeemer, this other guy, you know Naomi, who came back from Moab. You know this story, man. You, you know this lady. She's in your family. I'm sure you've heard about it. She is selling the land that belonged to our relative Elimelech. He said, well, wait, she didn't. She didn't have anything. Well, not technically. If you know anything about how the people of Israel, the Hebrews, came into the promised land, they were given out a land inheritance. That was through the leadership of Joshua and others that were working with him. They gave out a land inheritance. And so every family member, every tribe, but every family member would be given a piece of land. Why did they do that? It's so that they would maintain a place of livelihood that they would have a place that they, they could call their own. I think this is an awesome thing that God did for the people of Israel. And in this situation, when they left the land, the land was, when they left Judah and went to Moab, the land still belonged to them. And so when she came back, they were not able to maintain living. They, were, they had no food, no money. And so guess what they had to do? They had to sell off the land. Well, the sad thing about that is that means they're in a really hard place. Because to sell off the land, you, you are selling off your place of existence, your, your livelihood. You're selling off your legacy, what will be passed down to generations to come. Boaz says that she's selling this land, and he, he goes on to say, I thought I should speak to you about it so that you can redeem it if you wish. If you want the land, then buy it here in the presence of these witnesses. But if you don't want it, let me know right away because I am next in line to redeem it after you. Here's a question. This isn't on my notes, so they won't try to follow me in, in the booth here. Here's a question, though. Was Boaz interested in the land? No. Boaz is a smart dude. See, he, he realizes that the land was connected to Ruth. If you marry Ruth, you get the land. But he wasn't throwing Ruth out there. He was throwing the land out there first. Why? Because he wasn't interested in land. I'll be honest with you. I think Boaz was willing to give up the land. He wanted the lady. Right? That's who he was after. And so he throws this out to this guy. If you want it, then do something. I mean, you know all about this. You've known about this for some time now. And these two women are dying 
and they need help, and you're not doing anything about it. We don't catch this, but Boaz is making a point. In their culture, he's making a point about this guy's lack of concern. He's saying, you have a responsibility. You are the closest relative. You're supposed to redeem and do this job, this task, and you haven't done this yet. You're sitting on your hands, and they need your help. You're obligated to care for Ruth and Naomi because you are the closest relative, and they're starving to death, and you haven't done anything to help them. Now, some people may say, well, he, you know, he, he, he didn't do anything wrong, really. Well, I beg to differ with you on that. See, I think that he didn't do anything, and that was wrong. Because he didn't help family members. This man failed in his responsibilities. And Boaz was keenly bringing this to his attention. In front of the town leaders. You aren't living up to your responsibilities. What are you going to do about it? It's been long enough. What are you going to do about it? Hmm. And, you know, in the book of Ruth, we see three kinds of guys. And I just want to talk to the guys just for a moment. I mean, ladies, you, you're going to like this too. But guys, listen, there are three kinds of guys in this story. I mean, think about the, how they handle their responsibilities. You have Elimelech, the husband, the deceased husband of Naomi. He wanted to provide for his family, and that was a great thing. Provide for your family. Yeah, but use your head. He didn't use his head. He decides something without much thought. He didn't think about how his decision would affect his family throughout the generations. And so he wasn't very smart. So I encourage you, don't be like Elimelech, all right? Now we, we see this other guy, and I don't have a, known, a name for him, so we're going to call him the other guy. He was the closest relative to Naomi and Ruth. But he doesn't do anything wrong. He just doesn't do anything at all. I mean, he... He was a guy who didn't follow through on his responsibilities. He, he doesn't care what he's supposed to do. So he's not a good guy. So don't be like the other guy. Then you have a guy, Boaz. He's the guy who comes in and cleans up the mess of both of these guys. I mean, think about it. He, he wants not only to help these two widows short term, but he wants to become their long-term provider and protector. That's the guy that we need to be like. That's the guy who points us to another person spiritually who is that in our lives. And his name is Jesus, our Redeemer. So, so what does the other guy say? Boaz says, you're not fulfilling your responsibilities. You've got stuff to do and you're not doing it. What does the other guy say? He says, all right, I'll redeem it. Still, he's not talking about Ruth. He's just saying, I'll take the land. Oh, yeah, the land? I didn't know there was land. How much land? Is there acres? What's involved in it? Is it good land? Is it fertile? I'll take it. Sure, I'll take it. I'll take any land you want to give me. I'll take it, right? That's what he's saying. Then, I love that word, then Boaz told him, of course, your purchase of the land from Naomi also requires that you marry Ruth. Now, he didn't just stop there. He could have said just Ruth. But then he says, comma, <laughs> the Moabite. Moabite, person from Moab, the foreigner widow. Hmm. That way she can have children who would carry on her husband's name and keep the land in the family. <laughs> See, Boaz is saying, all right, you can take the land. That's, that's, legally, that's yours. But just so you know, the full responsibility includes that you would have to marry Ruth. A Moabite. And I know and you know that within our culture, Jewish culture, marrying foreign women kind of has a stigma to it. It's not very kosher. Most Hebrew men wouldn't want to marry foreigners. I'm just saying. And you know that, right? Because she's a foreigner. She's a Moabite. And you would have to marry her if you take the land, right? I mean, you're understanding that, right? You see what I'm getting at. I mean, I'm sure that's the way the conversation was going. And not only that, if you marry Ruth, just keep in mind that you, you're going to have to continue the family line and you're going to have to provide for those children as long as they need you to. Just so you know, that's the fine print of the agreement. Just so you know. 
What's he doing? He's opening up the guy's eyes. And look what happens. The family redeemer replies, oh, then I can't, I can't redeem it. I can't do it. I can't. I can't. Because this might endanger my own estate. You redeem the land. I can't do it. Now, don't we know that that's what Boaz was pushing for, right? I mean, come on. He's a, he's a savvy businessman. He is pushing for the deal to go his way, and all of a sudden it goes his way. And look what the writer he gives us some context here. I love this. It says, now in those days, it was the custom in Israel for anyone transferring a right of purchase to remove his sandal and hand it to the other party. This publicly validated the transaction. It's kind of like getting a notary public, you know, getting something notarized. This is what's taking place, transaction. So the other family redeemer drew off his sandal as he said to Boaz, you buy the land. So the guy went home without one sandal, all right? And Boaz doesn't waste any time. I mean, this guy's probably stood up, handed him his sandal, and is walking off, and he's just like a few steps out, and those 10 leaders are still there, right, that he has gathered. And Boaz says to the leaders and to the crowd, anyone standing around, anybody listening in my, that can hear my voice, this is what's taking place. You are witnesses that today I have bought from Naomi all the property of Elimelech, Kilion, and Malon, and with the land I have acquired, Ruth. That was his goal, right? Ruth. The Moabite widow from Malon to be my wife, this way she can have a son to carry on the family name of her dead husband and to inherit the family property here in this hometown. You, all of you, are witnesses today. So he is saying, I'm going to take care of what these other guys didn't take care of. I'm going to handle their responsibilities. None of these responsibilities really lay on me. They're really not my job. But I'm stepping in and I'm going to take care of it. I'm going to take care of everything. I'm going to redeem the land. I'm going to provide for Naomi. I'm going to marry Ruth. And I'm going to have kids with her. And I want all of you to know this is what's taking place. I love this picture of Boaz. Don't you? I mean, Boaz has no legal obligation, but he chooses to do this because he loves Ruth. And the leaders of the town witness everything, and the rest of Ruth 4 talks about them praying for them, excited about all that God's going to do. And as we wrap up, not only this study, but our series, I want you to think about the transitions in the book of Ruth, because there's been several. I mean, we've kind of walked through them together. The the story of the book of Ruth, what does it open up of? It opens up with a funeral. Kind of a sad way to open up the story, right? Funeral of people who didn't trust God. And now the story is ending with a wedding of people who completely trust God. Isn't that amazing? The transition in four chapters has been amazing. It's a beautiful story of redemption, especially in Ruth's life. Ruth goes from being a foreigner, an outsider, to being an insider. Here's what I want you to get down in your outline. This is so important. Following God leads to the blessings of God. Following God leads to the blessings of God. You say, you know, I'm not experiencing a lot of blessings in my life right now. My question is, are you following God? Well, yeah, I believe in God. No, that's not what I said. Are you following God? Following God means doing what God says. Staying in step with where he's going. Are you following? Because if you're not following, if you're not obeying what God says, Deuteronomy 28, I love this passage that Moses gives to the people of Israel. He basically says, you're going to have all of these blessings. God's going to bless you in the land. He's going to bless you in your home. He's going to bless you in your family. He's going to bless you all over, everywhere. Everything you do is going to be blessed. You know what he says? If you obey the Lord's commands, if you do what he says. Second half of Deuteronomy 20, 28, he says, but if you don't do what God says, you won't be blessed in the land. You won't be blessed in your home. You won't be blessed. In, in fact, he uses a word cursed outside of God's blessing. Friends, if you're not experiencing the blessings of God, you may not be following God. You may not be doing what God is calling you to do. Now, one thing I want to clarify, and I want to give kind of a caveat to this. So often we think that the blessings of God mean that everything is going to go great for us. 
The blessings of God mean that we're going to be rich, we're going to be healthy, we're going to be wise, our kids are going to be perfect, our job's going to be perfect, everything, our husband's going to be nice in the morning, our wife's going to be great, she's going to be waiting when I come home. I mean, all of, you know, that's what we think. We think Christianity is just, it's supposed to be that way and everything's going to be great. We're going to have the blessing of God, we're going to leave, live in the blessings of God and nothing wrong is ever going to happen to us. Where did you get that? Because obviously you are not reading your Bible. The Bible tells us, Paul tells us in Romans, that these things have been written so that we would learn from them. The Bible is written so that we would see what life is really like even as you follow God. Right? And the thing that I say so often to people, people that have come to me and have said, how can God allow this? How can, I just had somebody this week say, how can God allow the coronavirus? You know what my answer always is? We live in a broken world. I mean, honestly, you back all the way up to Genesis, and you see the world that God created. And then you see what happened when sin entered that world by man's choice in Genesis 3. And we, you and I, we live in a broken world because of sin. And you know as well as I do that there are some things in our lives that are broken because of our sin, right? Because of things that we've done wrong. Have you ever done something, let's say, in a relationship? Have you ever said something to somebody and you walk away or they walk away and you can see it on their face, they're hurt, and you say to yourself in your mind, why did I say that? You ever done that before? Am I the only one? I need help if I'm the only one, right? We, we all experience that. There are sometimes we face things that are broken in our life because of our sin. But we live in a world that's broken because of sin, period. And, and so life is never going to be perfect. Can it be full? Can it be better? Absolutely. And that's where I believe God comes into the picture. God changes I'm not sure if God changes your circumstances as much as he changes you, but either way, he changes your life. Right? And that's what we see here. The blessings of God in Ruth's life. Wow. Following God leads to the blessings every time. Look what it says. Boaz took Ruth into his home, and she became his wife. That's what they wanted, right? That's what Ruth wanted. That's what... Naomi wanted, that's what Boaz wanted. I mean, I still remember the look of my wife's face as she looked down the aisle 35 years ago. That's our wedding pictures. And actually, all of our wedding pictures that were taken inside um, when, when we got married, Dee and I got married 35 years ago, um, the guy's flash didn't work. We had a professional photographer, and it didn't work. And so we had to go to the Japanese gardens down in Los Gatos and um, have some pictures taken. Um, we had to re-rent the tux and the whole nine yards. So this was after wedding. But, but even with that said, um, you know, that's us. I remember, I remember her face when she came down the aisle. I remember seeing the smile on her face. She was happy. And I was too. I love my wife of 35 years. I love my, my kids. I believe in God's providence that, that he brought my wife and, uh, to me where I was. We, he started this whole thing. If you don't know, in a real nutshell, God brought a girl who grew up in Colorado to a Bible college in Santa Cruz. God brought this girl to a church in Fremont, California for a guest speaker that she knew of that was only speaking one time at a church. It happened to be my home church. That girl liked the church so much that she started commuting and attending. She got involved in the music department that the music pastor then put her in a vocal group, the one that I was in. That's how I met her. Isn't that amazing? I always say that I wrote her a card when she left on this trip, and I said, I'm still amazed that the Colorado girl met the California boy, and we got married. Hmm. I had no idea that God was going to do that. I had no idea of all that then we would experience and how God has blessed us all along, how we would go through, I mean, you guys know, for you that have been here, we'd go through Shannon, my oldest daughter's cancer, a couple of years ago, and now she's having her second baby. 
That's God's blessing. I'm sorry. That's, that's all I can say is that God is, is blessing. We're following. I know Shannon and Abe are following God, and, and God is blessing. And we're seeing it, just like he did for Ruth. I mean, can you imagine her feeling as she's coming into this now? And she's being taken as a wife into Boaz's home? Wow. Hmm. What a stark contrast, right? Famine, funerals, life without God, and now it's a wedding. Life is full when God enters the picture. Wow. Take a look. Verse 13, I love this verse. When Boaz slept with Ruth, the Lord enabled her to become pregnant. Let's read that again. Come on, read it with me. The Lord enabled her. Come on, read it. Come on with me. The Lord enabled her to become pregnant, and she gave birth to a son. Do you catch what I'm emphasizing here? The Lord enabled her. Now, I don't have any proof in this, but this was a question that I asked. How long was Ruth previously married to her first husband, and why didn't she have kids? She wasn't able. Maybe. I don't know. Isn't that interesting? And here it says, the Lord enabled her to get pregnant, to become pregnant. You know what this shows, and you may have missed it, so I'll just tell you what it was. Ruth chapter 1, it gives us the bookends of the book of Ruth. Ruth chapter 1, if you remember what happened, God gives a harvest to his people. Ruth chapter 4, God gives a baby. Isn't that beautiful? It's like the bookends of the book of Ruth. So God gives Ruth and Boaz a baby boy, and they name him Obed, which, by the way, means worship in Hebrew. Beautiful word, right? Obed. And look what we're told. He became the father of Jesse and the grandfather of David. Wait, wait, David. David as in King David. Yeah, that's the one. David as in King David. That's a pretty important family line, wouldn't you think? Yeah. So this gives us another truth, and you want to get this one down. This is better than the first. So write it down. God is always doing something bigger in me than I realize. God is always doing something bigger in me than I realize. Right now, God is doing something bigger in your life than you realize. Right now. You say, well, there's not much going on in my life. Doesn't matter. He works behind the scenes, right? We, we sang a song about that earlier. He works behind the scenes. He does. He, he moves in our lives in ways that we are not seeing him move. He is, he is directing our lives. He is orchestrating our lives. God is always doing something bigger in me than I realize. God's plan for my life is always bigger than I realize. But, there's another passage that we need to read before we wrap off that we're going to get this. And I'm not going to read the whole thing because it's pretty lengthy. And, and it's pretty boring, I'll be honest with you. It's just a family lineage. It's just a family heritage, a legacy heritage, an ancestral line that, uh, in Matthew chapter 1. It's the, it begins the New Testament, Matthew chapter 1. But I want to show you something that's really interesting that really shows us that God was doing something bigger than Ruth and Boaz could ever, 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 ever realize. Take a look at this family ancestry list in Matthew 1. It says, this is the record of the ancestors of who? Jesus the Messiah, a descendant of David. Oh, yeah, remember that? He is a descendant. Jesus was a descendant of King David. And we're going to skip down a few verses, and we pick it up where it says that Salmon was the father of Boaz. Wait, that's our Boaz. I mean, that's, that's our guy. Salmon was the father of Boaz, whose mother was, was Rahab. Do you know that name? Anybody know that name? I'm not gonna, I don't have the time to go into it, but that, that goes back to Joshua and the spies going into Jericho. Interesting that you've got another foreign woman in, in the storyline here. Oh, interesting. Huh? In fact, there's actually four women listed in the lineage of Jesus, which is kind of interesting. And, and all of them have stories behind them. Hmm. Whose mother was Rahab. Boab, or Boaz, rather, was the father of Obed, whose mother was Ruth. Obed was the father of Jesse. Jesse was the father of King David. And then we skip all the way to the end. So there's all these generations 
Now we skip down to where it says, Matan was the father of Jacob. And Jacob was the father of Joseph, the husband of Mary. Mary gave birth to Jesus, who is called the Messiah. <laughs> you see this? I'm Ruth. Hi, my name is Ruth. You know how they do it in groups. Hi, my name is Ruth. Come on. Right. Yeah. And I, and I, um, I went through um, the death of my first husband and um, with no hope and nothing. My mother-in-law, mother-in-law and I, we moved back to her hometown, really didn't know what was going to take place. We had no help. And then, we, then I met this guy, Boaz, who was a very generous landowner, business owner, and, and, and he's stepping into my life. And I have hopes that maybe he and I will hit it off and, and, and we'll get married. But, but right now, you know, I'm kind of at this stage where I, I, I just don't know. And I, if you were to ask Ruth at that point, if you were to ask Ruth, hey, do you think you're going to be connected to the Messiah? What do you think she would have said? Not in a million years, right? That's the farthest thing from her mind. But God is saying that lady is going to be connected. And not only connected, she's going to be in Scripture. She's going to be in the canon of Holy Scripture. Her name, her story, and her name is going to be listed in the lineage of my son. Now, here's the thing. What does God have planned for you? You say, well, I'm old, doesn't really matter. Don't have very many years left. Everybody do this with me. Take a breath. Did you, did you take a breath? Okay. You know what that means? You're still on this side of the grass. You're still alive. You still got breath. Doesn't matter how old you are. God has a purpose for you. He has something bigger for you. If you're a senior adult in this room, you need to hear this. He has a purpose for you. It goes all the way through the generations, and then it comes to the younger generation. Listen, if you're saying, I don't know what my purpose is, oh, man, God does. God knows what he has for you. Do you see why we need to follow God? I mean, this, this alone, if you want to get in on what he wants to do, the bigger thing that he wants to do in your life, you need to be following him. Ruth had no idea. God gives Ruth and Boaz a son named Obed, and Obed becomes the grandfather of King David, through whom would come Jesus. Ruth is included in the genealogy of Jesus. Isn't that amazing? You never know what God has for you when you follow him. I believe that. God is always doing something bigger in me, always doing something bigger in me that, that more than I can realize. His plan for my life is always bigger than I realize. And most of the time, we only have our eyes on what's in front of us. We only have our, lives on, our eyes on, on our life right now, everyday circumstances, everyday stuff, today's events. We live in the here and now. But listen, God operates on a different level. His plans for our lives always involve more than we can think. His plans for our lives always always take us farther and push us deeper. His plans for our lives always affect more people than just me. The Apostle Paul says, with God's power working in us, God can do much, much more than anything we can ask or imagine. Come on, say this with me. God is always doing something bigger in me than I realize. Something bigger in me. God is doing something bigger in me. Come on, just say that part with me. God is doing something bigger in me. That's what we need to have. That's what we need to hold on to. That's what we need to hear today. Is that God is doing something bigger in me, in you. He's doing something bigger than we realize. 